Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, very happy to have been invited here and uh, look forward to learning a bunch of things myself uh, later today. So I've got, uh, I've got the interesting task of getting through about 59 slides in 25 minutes or so. And I'm going to be, I am literally going to be uh, going through here fairly quickly. So bear with me. Uh, we'll have time for questions at the end of the three presentations as I understand it. So, gotta go through this, I'm, so I'm spending less than my average of 30 seconds per slide on that. <clears throat> and uh, we put together learning objectives for, on behalf of the AIA uh, purpose. <clears throat> so, uh, the outline of the presentation, I'll give a brief introduction of how the process works for the ICC. Uh, we will then talk about performance objectives that the committee developed. Uh, on the code changes, and then I'll get into the proposed changes themselves, and, uh, and then uh, a summary at the end. So, uh, there was a brief uh, introduction to this process at the last session, and uh, I'll get into a little bit more detail. In 2015, in, in December of 2015, the ICC board, the International Code Council Board of Directors, established a committee to look at this topic in much greater detail. If you're familiar with the code change process at ICC, uh, it's typically the presenter, the proponent of a code change, has three minutes of time to present the code change, all the rationale, technical background, etc., and then there are uh, three-minute periods allowed for each proponent and each opponent of the code change. That is not going to work for a very detailed technical matter like this. So the ICC board established the ad hoc committee to look into this topic in great detail and put together a package of proposals uh, to explore the building science of tall wood buildings uh, and investigate the feasibility of and the development of code changes to support uh, the design and construction of taller, larger wood buildings than what's currently allowed. So we had our first uh, organizational meeting in the spring of 2016. Uh, as Susan mentioned earlier today, if you were in that presentation, uh, we sat in a conference room in, in Chicago for most of those meetings near O'Hare. And our goal was to put together a series of proposals that uh, by the deadline of January of 2018 for the 20, what will be the 2021 edition of the IBC and the IFC. These changes were submitted in, uh, in January by the deadline, and they're available on the ICC website. If anybody's interested in seeing them in detail, they're on the ICC website um, prior to the hearings that are going to take place next month. So the ICC board recognized the need to do this and put together appointed committee members. There are 18 <coughs> committee members on the, on the ad hoc committee. Uh, and there are representative uh, cross-section of people who are building officials, fire officials, fire service people, uh, architects, engineers, industry people, and other stakeholders. Uh, the chair of our committee was a, a gentleman named Steve DiGiovanni, who's from Clark County, Nevada, in the Division of uh, Building and Fire Prevention, a person who I've known for many years, and, uh, and, and who did uh, a very nice job with managing the affairs of the committee. We broke the uh, activity of the committee uh, into uh, four what we call work groups, which are essentially subcommittees and, and identified as uh, definitions and standards, a fire subcommittee, structural subcommittee, and one called codes, which, which I chaired, which was essentially everything else that's not the first three. Um, and we also allowed participation, in fact, we encouraged and asked for participation by all various other stakeholders, non-committee members, and we had perhaps participation by maybe 50 or 60 members of the public and industry and other interested parties in doing the work of the, uh, of the committee. Uh, we had probably over the last uh, year and a half plus, we had probably uh, about 100 in-person or uh, uh, teleconference meetings, and uh, it, it was a very intense process. Uh, we 
looked at something like 82 major issues that we thought needed to be changed or would be affected by the change in, in the cover-to-cover -cover review of the International Building Code and also the International Fire Code. So we identified what we thought might be these 82 issues and, and uh, we said, well, either that has to be changed or it doesn't have to be changed. And we made, we ended up at the end of the day uh, resulting in 17 major changes that we proposed for the IBC and the IFC. And that's what you can find on the, on the website today. We'll talk about them in detail. Uh, one of the other things that the committee did is we looked at all available information. We looked at uh, research that's available in the literature. Uh, the National Fire Protection Research Foundation, by the way, I'm a fire guy, I'm a fire protection engineer uh, by, by profession. And uh, fire drives a lot of what's in the building code and a lot of what is in the proposal is, is, is fire driven. So the NFPA Research Foundation did a study uh, which is also available on the NFPA website, nfpa.org. It's part one of a, uh, of a research project that they did and that is a literature search, uh, pretty comprehensive. And what you see on the right there is a report that was done by the architecture firm uh, Skidmore Owings and Merrill. It's available on its website, som.com. It's a, it's a uh, a study of a 42-story uh, tall wood building based on a 42-story uh, non-combustible building that they did and they re-looked at it as if they were designing it in wood today in detail. It's actually two parts, part one being the, the technical aspects of it and part two being a, a very detailed cost analysis of uh, what, it what it would be if they did it in uh, in wood versus uh, non-combustible traditional materials. So uh, we looked at things like that. We also looked at, uh, it's been alluded to earlier and you'll hear more about it later today, the NFPA part two, the Research Foundation project part two had fire tests that were done. And then our committee did our own fire test as directed by the fire work group of our committee. Uh, this is uh, some of the uh, uh, some of the results of test number one on the screen here. Uh, you can go to the AWC website, if you like, and see the videos. And some of these videos run for three hours, but they're at 32 times speed, so you don't need to spend three hours watching them. But they are very interesting, and we had five tests, which will be talked about in greater detail later today. But uh, again, the point is we did a, everything we could to find available information, literature. We took testimony from designers and developers uh, at our committee. We tried to leave no stone unturned in our work. So one of the things we did is uh, we as a committee established performance objectives. I'm very proud of this because I think that's, that's how this ought to be done. We did that back in the 70s when high-rise buildings were first being uh, uh, codified. And uh, I was an advocate of using what we call here the systems concept, which was developed in the, in the fire protection community by uh, a gentleman there on the bottom right named uh, Bud Nelson, one of my uh, industry mentors. He was a, an, a, an employee at the GSA and a fire protection engineer for GSA. And this was done in the 1970s for tall conventional buildings and we said let's take let's use the same approach uh, when we did our work for the tall wood buildings. I'm not so proud to say that we did not use this in a vigorous way. We, we did get a bit diverted uh, by some traditional uh, thinking but, uh, but I think we did end up with developing performance objectives. And we have six performance objectives that we talked about. One is that under a complete burnout of the building, not considering automatic sprinklers, we should not have collapse of the structure. The building should be able to stand even without sprinklers functioning. Uh, also, our building, if it's fully uh, involved in fire, should not create an exposure to adjoining property that would ignite an, an adjoining property. And conversely, 
if there is a fire on an adjoining property, our building should be able to take that radiation exposure and not ignite our building. So that was, a, that was another performance objective. Also that there should be no unusual fire department access issues in our type four building, our heavy timber tall building. Uh, the egress system should be designed to protect building occupants to allow their uh, ability to leave the building, including a factor of safety, and that we should have uh, highly reliable fire suppression systems. Even though our fire tests don't, uh, didn't count them in, in the uh, types of construction I'll talk about, we still want them to work, we expect them to work, and we want them to be reliable. Okay, so uh, what did we end up with? Let's get to our, our changes. And one of the, uh, or a couple of the changes that resulted from our committee work are some specific definitions. And I'll just talk about a couple that are, that are uh, um, I think, more relevant to this group. We uh, developed the term mass timber. We defined the term mass timber, which incorporates all the various types of technologies of CLT and NLT and DLT and glue lamb and the traditional heavy timber type of construction. We coined a term uh, uh, non-combustible protection, which I'll talk about in more detail. We revised uh, some structural definitions for load-bearing walls to include mass timber. Uh, we tweaked the definition for primary structural frame and secondary members. So mass timber includes, again, traditional heavy timber, which was in the code as type four construction and uh, CLT, was recognized in the last edition. Glue lamb, nail laminated, uh, cross laminated, and dowel laminated types of uh, products are considered all mass timber. And the, the specific definition for mass timber is up on the screen. Uh, structural elements of type four construction, primarily of solid built up uh, panelized or engineered wood products that meet the minimum cross section dimensions and that are specified in the code elsewhere. Also another important definition is this term non-combustible protection. Uh, this, this consists of materials that uh, provide an increased fire resistance rating to delay or prevent ignition of mass timber uh, components. So those are the two important ones I wanted to mention here this morning. So let's get into the types of construction that we developed. You heard a little bit about this earlier today. We ended up as a committee proposing three new types of type four construction. And the reason we did that is because uh, there were different goals that certain uh, members uh, wanted to achieve. Uh, some members of the committee wanted to achieve the exposed wood look. Some wanted to go tall. Uh, some wanted a combination. So these three new types of construction allow these goals to be met by some of the folks on the committee and some of the people in, in the public that we heard from. And we call them type 4A, 4B, and 4C. And each of them has different uh, fire resistance ratings, exposed, non-exposed, we'll talk about that in a minute. We also decided as a committee that the traditional type 4 construction that's in the IBC, we said we we're going to leave everything alone. So wherever the code referred to type 4 construction, we called it type 4 HT. And we had a philosophy of do no harm to the existing provisions of uh, type four construction. I want to ask, get a show of hands here if I can. Uh, folks who are familiar with the IBC, work with the IBC, that's, that's a pretty good uh, part of this group, that's good. So type 4A is a mass timber building with non-combustible uh, protection of the structural elements that achieve a three hour fire resistance rating. And I know a lot of my good uh, colleagues at, at my firm and other folks in the profession, good structural engineers, can design exposed wood structural members to achieve a passive three-hour rating relying on the, on the dimensions of the wood and the char that would take place. We know the char rate from experiments. And people can design an entirely exposed structural element to achieve a three-hour rating and still 
carry the load following the char being uh, uh, reaching its maximum. Well, that's not what the committee decided was good. The committee said in types uh, 4A and 4B, whenever there's a specified rating of three hours or two hours, that two-thirds of the rating must be achieved by passive protection, such as gypsum board. So in the case of type 4A, with a three-hour rating, two hours of that rating must come from passive means, such as gypsum board, uh, although there is, a, there is a procedure to allow other types of protection uh, products. Type 4B is a mass timber design with uh, a mass timber building with two hour structural fire resistance rating. Portions of that can be exposed on the ceilings and walls. We'll talk more about that. And type 4C is entirely exposed wood. And you saw a little bit earlier today that 4A is the more superior type and uh, 4C is the uh, least of the uh, superior in terms of fire resistance ratings and, and the allowable heights are correlated accordingly. So if you're familiar with the IBC, as you say you are, uh, this is table 601 which has the fire resistance ratings based on the types of construction. And if you have binoculars, you can see three new columns of types 4, A, B, and C with ratings of three hours and two hours, and I'm going to blow that up a bit here. Those columns 4A, 4B, and 4C, uh, based on the various components of, of, of beams and columns and roofs and so forth, uh, three hours, and then uh, the, the column that says HT is the same as it was. We did not mess with that other than call it type 4 HT. All right, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time there, but again, if you're really into this, look at the code changes on the ICC website. Uh, I alluded to this a little bit uh, ago, is that uh, non-combustible protection is achieved uh, by uh, what's going to be a couple of tables in Chapter 7 of the IBC that when hourly ratings are specified and two-thirds of those must be achieved by passive means, that one can follow the prescriptive method in the lower table there uh, by using uh, uh, materials that have been designated by the code as achieving either a 30-minute or a 40-minute protection, again, unless one wants to go further uh, with doing some other experiments. This is prescriptive and in the code, you can just go right there and use, use for example, two layers of 5 8 inch type X gypsum wall board to get 40 minutes of the, uh, two layers to get 80 minutes, which is two thirds uh, of the two hours, or of the three hours. So that's, uh, that is uh, in the code, that will be in uh, tables in the code with that. Uh, we also made a modification, chapter six, or table 602, based on exposure. Again, this is one of the uh, changes we, we uh, made as a result of going through the code from cover to cover. So again, uh, in summary here, mass timber elements uh, provide fire resistance rating prescribed by table 601 or 602. Um, there's, a, there's a provision in the code. We had a lot of committee discussion about the adhesives, the NFPA, the NFPA series of fire tests showed some delamination of the CLT and the, the product then falling to the floor of the, uh, of the test room, rekindling and reigniting the next layer of CLT. And that was a concern to a lot of folks on our committee. Um, so what we ended up doing is uh, uh, proposing a lot. We put a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, pressure on the uh, on the industry to revise PRG 320, which was done, and it will now require that uh, materials, laminated materials must have heat resistant adhesives. Uh, it's important, if you hear people criticize the NFPA tests, it's important to realize those tests sponsored by the insurance company were for a different purpose. They were for the insurance industry to learn what they wanted to know about uh, the mass timber buildings, and we learned, we, our committee, learned from those tests 
and saw some of the some of the details that were not important to their test program, but we thought would be important to include in the building code changes. And so we got kind of persnickety with our series of tests with the joints and adhesives and, and sealants and, and all kinds of other details which are in, the, in our proposed change based on what we learned from those tests. <clears throat> One of the other things is that in, in the types 4A, B, and C, all interior partitions, all light frame elements must be either non-combustible or mass timber. No light wood frame members allowed in the structure. So you're probably asking, and I've already, you've already um, been exposed to this answer, but this is an 80-story mass timber building that was proposed for London. Anybody see this in the literature? These things are all over in the literature, all around the world. So is the IBC going to allow an 80-story mass timber building? No. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Uh, you've already uh, heard that uh, the maximum number of stories for business, residential, for example, this is the table that's, a lot, that's proposed by our committee for, for uh, number of stories. Um, 18 stories. We, we started talking about 40-story buildings and 30-story buildings and 24-story buildings. Uh, the consensus of our committee, frankly, we ended up, I think, I think our overall package is fairly conservative. Uh, we had to please the various interests on our committee who were more conservative, uh, folks such as the fire service who have to deal with these buildings and they've had some experience with dealing with the uh, combustible building fires and they, they're skewed in that direction. So we scaled back and we have 18 stories maximum building for the type 4A, the most fire resistant type. Where did that number come from? Uh, we looked at what's currently allowed by, by the code for type 1B. We applied some multipliers to it and then we did some judgment. We did modifications where we applied judgment to the other uses like institutional uses healthcare, for example, or hazardous usage, and we scale back from there. So we did not apply that multiplier across the board. Uh, we did it with judgment, and for those of you who don't know, the heights and areas tables in the IBC, there's nothing scientific about them in the first place. They are, they are uh, derived from experience, they're derived from judgment, they're derived from loss experience the insurance industry had many, many years ago. So you can't calculate that answer, but it is a uh, basically a judgment. So we did that for the, uh, for the various uses you'll see in this table. I won't spend a lot of time here, but again, the maximum number is 18 stories, which is circled here in this slide is all for the residential. Same thing with feet, uh, and same thing with allowable area. And again, I'm not going to go through this, but we, again, we used multipliers based on what was currently allowed for other types of construction and applied judgment. So that's what the proposed change to uh, 602.4 looks like, where it specifically references types 4A, 4B, and 4C. I got to accelerate here a little bit. I've been given the high sign. Uh, and then one, another, important, another important provision of our changes is that all exterior walls, non-combustible exterior walls on the outside of the mass timber, must be non-combustible. Our work was going on not only during the eclipse we had, but also during the time where the Grenfell fire in London occurred, and that really raised a lot of issues in our committee. We didn't want to be part of that problem. So we have types 4A, 4B, 4C are all non-combustible exterior walls. And uh, this again is a summary of 4A, 4B. You saw this slide, something similar a little bit earlier today. I won't repeat that. Let me get into the next major issue here. I, I, by the way, I think, again, overly conservative type 4B with the limitations on the percentages and the separation distances. Uh, our tests show that sprinklers, we tests four and five, we had sprinkler protection, worked great. Uh, but again, this is fairly conservative. So what's gonna happen if a client comes to me and says, Carl, we'd like to build a 40 story or a 30 story. We have other protection features that we can employ uh, which are not required today, which can, can even out the risk if we had to. 
So other issues, uh, we talked about sprinkler system reliability. We uh, are requiring buildings over 120 feet. Buildings over 120 feet tall will have to have on-site water storage, as if as the code currently does for buildings over 420 feet. Bit conservative, yes. Uh, Non-combustible protection, we talked about that. Um, the owner is gonna be responsible over the life of the building to do annual inspections to make sure the passive protection's in place. And during construction, there are provisions for water supply. There are provisions for providing that passive protection, uh, keeping up with the construction as it, as it increases in height. Concealed spaces. Uh, concealed spaces in type four construction are normally not allowed. But in our case, we know that's gonna happen because of ceilings and bathrooms and kitchens. If concealed spaces are included in a building, they must have membrane, non-combustible protection, no exposed wood, and cannot contain anything other than the mechanical equipment that's allowed in the mechanical code. Uh, if walls are used for fire separations, they cannot have exposed wood. They must have a, a minimum half-inch gypsum board sheathing. And elevator, stairway shafts, buildings over 12 stories or 180 feet must be non-combustible construction with the appropriate rating. Exterior walls I talked about already must be non-combustible. So the committee is going to uh, hear these proposed changes next month in Columbus, and there'll be a recommendation to the membership, and then the final action will take place in uh, Richmond, Virginia in October. And if that all happens, we'll end up with the provisions in the 2021 IBC and IFC. So I believe uh, if we, we as a committee believe that our work product, our proposed change package meets those performance objectives that we established at the beginning of this project and we'll end up with provisions that will result in tall buildings that, be, that are safe. So I'll stop right here and we get into the next presentation. Thank you.